In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation and Happy Solemnity Feast Day of Mary. Because every year, December 8th, we celebrate the great solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And of course, we'll be talking about this wonderful, wonderful solemnity today. Mary has many beautiful titles. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. And also Mary is the immaculate conception. What a beautiful, beautiful feast day that we are celebrating today. The immaculate conception. Praise the Lord. So, let's uh, start off by inviting Mary to be with us as we say the beautiful prayer that she loves most, and that prayer is the Hail Mary. So, together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's invite our spiritual director to be with us. Our spiritual director is the is the Holy Spirit. Our spiritual director is is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. He's also known as the Gift of Gifts. He's also known as the Sweet Guest of Our Souls. The Holy Spirit is also known as the cons our Consoler. He's our Consoler and also he is our Counselor. If that were not enough, the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. So if we <coughs> truly want to grow in the holiness of life, then the Holy Spirit is the key to this holiness of life. So let's uh, let's also ask the Holy Spirit to teach us to pray. St. Paul reminds us, he says, we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's pray to the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, a lot of peace, and a lot of joy, as we say. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the lay of the Holy Spirit, Grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, <coughs> conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. 
Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So we like to welcome you on this wonderful solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I will have two Masses today, a con-celebrated Mass at 12 noon with the other priests, to honor the Immaculate Conception of Mary, and also I'll be celebrating a 6 o'clock Mass in the evening. So in these two Masses that I'll be celebrating, I will place all of you and your intentions on the altar that God would bless you in a very, very special way today on this feast day of the Immaculate Conception. So in this, uh, this intention, I'd like to pray that all of us would strive as we honor Mary today to be open to the mystical spouse of Mary. The mystical spouse of Mary is the Holy Spirit. We might even say, pray during the course of the day, this prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come to the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come to the heart of Mary. That, be, that can be a prayer that we say today, along with, O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. My second attention, I'd like to pray that all of you on this solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of Mary would experience great peace and joy and happiness by your devotion to Mary, that through Mary's prayers that we would be able to reject in our lives sin and all that can lead us to sin. Because the primary reason for sadness in our lives, in our country, in our families, in the whole world is a result of sin. Sin is what causes sadness in general. So the more that we have devotion to Mary, the more we'll be able to walk away from sin and all that leads into sin. And then the, fault, the last intention, the last intention would be, let's pray to Mary on her solemnity, her feast day, that all those who died today, and there will be people dying today throughout the world, through Mary's powerful intercession, her great love for God and God's great love for her, that no no person who dies today would die in the state of mortal sin, but they would die by begging for God's infinite mercy and that they would be saved. I really believe that that prayer is very pleasing to God. So let's constantly pray for the salvation of souls, our own souls, of course, our family members. But pray for the conversion of poor sinners who are walking on the brink possibly of hell possibly of hell 
So we we welcome you all to our conversation today. And what we'd like to do today is talk, of course, of this great privilege of Mary the Immaculate Conception. I'd like to welcome all of you who are tuning in now and once again beg that God would bless you most abundantly today on this uh, wonderful, wonderful solemnity. Just that you're aware of it, that the Immaculate Conception that we celebrate today is the patroness of the United States of America. That's right. Our Lady Guadalupe is the patroness of Mexico as well as all of the Americas. But the Immaculate Conception is the patroness of the United States. So let's beg Mary to to really pray for our country. Morally speaking, our, our country is in great need of Mary's prayers. The whole reality of abortion, the whole reality of transgenderism, the attacks against the family, the proliferation of pornography, the waves of violence that are are rocking our country, uh, we can surely use Mary's prayers now more than ever. Let's ask Mary to pray. Let's pray that one day, as soon as possible, her immaculate heart will triumph. And she says, there will be peace. There will be peace once her immaculate heart triumphs. Okay, so let's let's enter into this wonderful <clears throat> day in which we honor the Immaculate Conception. So let's start with uh, just naming the Marian dogmas and let's explain what, what, what exactly is the Immaculate Conception. Invite you all to uh, eventually purchase my new book, which is that of Compendium of Marian Devotions, in which there there is a chapter on the Immaculate Conception. So there there are actually four there are actually four Marian dogmas. And these are Marian truths that the church has proclaimed officially and we have to believe them. And these would be, these would be first the Immaculate Conception, the second would be Mary's Divine Maternity, the third would be Mary's Perpetual Virginity, and the fourth would be Mary's Assumption into Heaven. Those are the four Marian dogmas that the church has proclaimed. The Immaculate Conception that we'll explain today. The Divine Maternity, which means that Mary is truly the Mother of God. And that's the whole meaning of Christmas, the birthday of Christ. Mary's perpetual virginity, that Mary was virgin before the birth of Christ, during the birth of Christ, and after the birth of Christ. And last but not least, we have the last Marian dogma that was proclaimed officially by Pope Pius XII on November 1st, 1950. And that would be Mary's assumption into heaven in body and soul. Mary's assumption of heaven and body and soul. So the Immaculate Conception, the Immaculate Conception was actually proclaimed <coughs> in the year 1858. So the Immaculate Conception was con was actually proclaimed in the year 19, 
1854. Eight, 1854. That's when it's proclaimed as a dogma. <coughs> And it's interesting that just four years later, when Mary appears to St. Bernadette Subiru in France, Mary appears 18 times. And at the end, Bernadette was asking, can you please tell us who you are? And Mary folds her hands, lifted, lifts her gaze to heaven, and says in French, I am the Immaculate Conception. I am the Immaculate Conception. So, the Immaculate Conception is the following. To understand the Immaculate Conception, we have to understand the whole dogma of original sin. And that's actually the first reading today. First reading today is taken from the book of, the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we have the sin of Adam and Eve. So I repeat, for us to understand the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, we must understand another dogma, and that is the dogma of original sin. So when I say the dogma of original sin, we're stating this that Adam and Eve were created in the, in the image and likeness of God. They are our first parents. And Adam and Eve, to show their love for God, they had to pass a test. What was that test that they had to pass? It was a test of obeying God on a very simple, very simple matter that all the trees in the Garden of Eden, that Adam and Eve could not take from one of those trees, and that would be in the middle of the garden, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Eve drew close to that forbidden fruit, the serpent, the serpent drew close and started to talk to Eve, telling Eve why she should not eat from that fruit. And Eve said, "We should. I should not because God said, if I eat from that fruit, then I will die. The serpent, the father of lies, said, you will not die, but you will your eyes will be open and you'll know God. You'll know good and evil. So Eve looked up at the fruit and she plucked the fruit and she ate from the fruit. Then she gave it to Adam. And there we have what is called original sin. And this original sin that we're talking about now, original sin that we're talking about now, is like a moral tsunami that has repercussions until the very end of the world. That's right. Original sin has repercussions in our cosmos until the end of the universe. So all of us, all of us, are born with original sin. All of us are conceived in original sin. 
With our baptism, this original sin is washed clean. But even after a baptism, we, ex we experience the effects of original sin in our lives. We experience the effects of original sin in our lives. So, with our entering into this world, we are contaminated, so to speak, with the poison of original sin. Now the case, and this came from our first parents, Adam and Eve. The case of Mary, it was different. There are many prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of Mary, especially Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A virgin will conceive and bring forth a son whose name is Emmanuel which means God with us. That's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Now in Mary's case, it was different, so I'll, I'll try to explain it. Tradition has given the, the, the parents of Mary are Anne, and Joachim would be the father of, of Mary. So I've written down for us, the name of the parents of Mary would be both Anne and Joachim, whose feast day we celebrate July 27th. According to tradition, these parents these parents were very holy people, very good people. However, they suffered a lot. And their suffering was their infertility, that they couldn't seem to have a child. But we see in their lives great generosity. They had economic means at, the, at their disposal. So they would give generously. God loves a joyful, generous giver. How true that is. God loves a generous, joyful giver. <clears throat> now, for us, we struggle in giving. But they gave a third, they gave a third of what they had to the upkeep of the temple. They gave another third to the poor. And finally, they gave another third, they kept another third for themselves. So they're not simply giving 10%, they're giving 66 and two thirds percent of what they own away. So we see in them great generosity. And God cannot be outdone in generosity. So God looking down upon this holy couple that suffered And as Julie has just pointed out, they're perfect models for all grandparents. And that's true. And by the way, as Julie's pointing out, that they're actually the patrons of, of grandparents because they were the grandparents of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus only had two grandparents. So, what we have here is God looked down upon Anne and Joachim and showed them great kindness by bestowing upon them the greatest of all gifts. And that gift would be the Blessed Virgin Mary. So how does it come about?
We shouldn't confuse the Immaculate Conception with the Virginal Conception. Because actually in the Gospel today we'll have the Virginal Conception. So let's try to differentiate between the two. The Immaculate Conception took place in the womb of St. Anne. That's right. took place in the womb of St. Anne. So after many years not being able to conceive a child by the marital union of Anne and Joachim, St. Anne conceived, but in that very moment of conception, the very moment of conception, God intervened. In a very special way, and we would call this also a miracle because God can do all things. God can do all things. So what we have is, right in the moment of that conception, in the womb of St. Anne, God intervenes, and the key word, the key word is, is, that I've just written it down for all of you, is preserved, preservation. Preserve Mary from the stain of original sin. At this juncture, I often like in my talks on this topic, which I spoke about last Sunday in my Marian Compendium talks I'm giving, is that there is an English poet who is not even a Catholic that really honored Mary by penning these words related to the Immaculate Conception. Mary is our tainted nature's solitary boast. How about that? This is William Wordsworth, who is an English poet, not even a Catholic. William Wordsworth said, Mary is our tainted nature's solitary boast. By these poetic words of Wordsworth, he's saying, of all human nature, of all human nature, Mary is the only one that we can boast was not tainted with original sin, and of course, the fruit of her womb our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I'd just like to now specify the difference between the Immaculate Conception and the Virginal Conception. So the Immaculate Conception refers to Mary's conception in the womb of St. Anne. Now we go to the Gospel today. So the first reading we have Eve disobeying God by committing original sin. Eve by saying no to God. The Gospel we have the exact opposite. We have Mary, Mary saying yes to God. That's right. Eve saying no to God and Mary saying yes to God. So what do we have? Fathers of the church make a marked contrast between Eve and Mary. The word the name Eve actually means mother of all the living. 
So Eve is our first mother. Mary is the mother of all the living in the realm of grace. So we go to the gospel today and we encounter Mary encountering God's ambassador. And that ambassador is an archangel, the archangel Gabriel, who greets her with those words, Hail, full of grace. Hail, full of grace. And the angel announces to Mary that she will conceive in her womb and bring forth a son. And her son's name will be Jesus because he'll save the people of their sins. This is the, the Annunciation. Now Mary, Mary had made a, a vow to God. A vow is a solemn promise that, that one makes, a vow to God. And that vow was the vow of perpetual virginity. Mary wanted to give herself fully and totally to God, unreservedly. So Mary hearing from the Archangel Gabriel that she's going to have a child could not understand how she could be maintain her vow of virginity and be mother at the same time. So the Archangel clarifies this to her saying that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, this is called the Shekinah, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, and that Mary would conceive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the Archangel Gabriel gives to Mary a sign. And that sign is another miracle. She says, Behold your kinswoman, Elizabeth, she who was considered to be barren, is already in her sixth month, because nothing is impossible with God. Because nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. So Mary, listening, understanding the impact of this message, Mary gives her consent. And Mary says, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. In that moment, here we have what is called the virginal conception that Mary conceives our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. Mary, without losing that vow she'd made to God of her virginity. And that we call also the incarnation of the Word of God. And we, we read through this in John chapter 1 in the prologue, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the Immaculate Conception. This is the Immaculate Conception.
I'm sorry. That that what you just said is the virginal conception. Mary can so the Immaculate Conception refers to Mary being conceived in the womb of Saint Anne, whereas the virginal conception refers to Jesus being conceived in the womb of Mary. I'd like to tell you a story about the power of Mary by means of the miraculous medal. About two weeks ago in my talks on my Marian Compendium, I gave a talk on the miraculous medal. In the miraculous medal, my friends, is also known as the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. So here's a story that I like to tell showing you the power of Mary to convert. convert. And it's the story and I'll be able to type it out for you. His name is Radisbone. Alphonse Radisbone. This was a this was a Frenchman uh, who was basically a non a non believer. He was a Jew, but didn't really practice his faith. And he um, had a good Catholic friend. They traveled from France to Rome. And the friend of Radisbaum asked him to wear the miraculous medal. To wear the miraculous medal. To wear the miraculous medal. So I've shown you two sides of the miraculous medal. So Radisbaum, because he had a very good rapport with his Catholic friend, decided he would wear the medal. So his friend uh, goes to church in Rome, and the name of the church is San Andrea del Frate, and I've actually been there. It's the place where St. Maximilian Colby celebrated his first Mass in the church of San Andre del Frate. And while Radisbone was waiting from his is waiting for his friend inside the church. Something happened that would radically change the life of this Alphonse Radisbon. While his friend delayed in, I think, talking with a priest there in the church, Alphonse was alone in the church and Mary appeared to him. And the essence of this encounter was Mary wanted Alphonse to seek out a priest and to start his preparation to become a Catholic. And I forgot to mention this, that he would wear the miraculous medal and I think that he promised that he would pray the memorare every day. That prayer, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary. So he had this encounter with the Blessed Mother. And she wanted him to seek out a priest, which he did do. So he could be catechized, he could become a Catholic. So it happened. This is all as a result of him wearing the miraculous medal and praying that short prayer every day. 
so after Alphonse had finished his catechetical preparation, and he was one of one of the most prominent men in France back years back. <clears throat> Alphonse, after he was prepared, was baptized a Catholic. He made his first communion, and he was confirmed. Also, his brother, his Jewish brother, also, as a result of Radis Bones' conversion, Alphonse had told his brother about this, and his brother was so impressed that his brother actually became a Catholic. But the story's not over. Alphonse had a girlfriend, and he dumped her. And he enters into the seminary, and Alphonse Radisbon is ordained a Catholic priest. His brother also. Story, the story is still not over. So this is a, a Jewish convert to Catholicism and from Catholicism, he actually becomes a Catholic priest with his brother. It's a fascinating story. But it doesn't end there. Because he and his brother were instrumental in founding a new it's a new congregation in honor of Mary. And the name of the new congregation would be, I'll type it out for you, there you have it, Our Lady of Zion. Now what was the purpose of this new congregation. The purpose of it was to receive into it Jewish converts. Jewish converts to Catholicism. And he and his brother would be the founders, the prominent founders of this new order, welcoming Jewish people that would want to become Catholics. Building upon this, probably one of the most famous converts to Catholicism among the Jewish people is now a Catholic saint. The name of this person would be Edith Stein. Edith Stein was a Jewish intellectual who taught philosophy, phenomenology, and she was converted to Catholicism. Especially through the writings of St. Teresa of Avila. And Edith Stein would go on to become not only Catholic, but she decided to become a Carmelite nun and her sister Rosa followed her. She lived in the time of the Second World War. 
In becoming a Carmelite, she changed her name from Edith Stein to Sister Benedict of the Cross. That's right, Sister Benedict of the Cross. And she was arrested by the Nazis with her sister Rosa. And she was put to death by the Nazis. One of the greatest sufferings of Edith Stein was the fact that she loved her mother very much. And Vera Contreras has pointed out that she had an IQ of 205. Very true. She was a brilliant woman. A brilliant woman. A brilliant philosopher. But even beyond her IQ, she was a great, great saint. And she actually became a, a martyr. She actually became a martyr. A martyr, a Carmelite martyr. And of course, the Carmelites have great devotion to Mary under the title of the, sc the scapular, wearing the scapular. You probably notice the Carmelites wear a, a long drape. That's actually their, their scapular. So my friends, to honor the Immaculate Conception, and as I said at the beginning of our conversation, this is our, Mary is our, our patroness. She's our patroness. Patroness of the Americas is our Lady Guadalupe. The patroness of the United States is the Immaculate Conception. If you ever have the chance to go to Washington, D.C., there we have the most glorious church in our country. And the church is the, it's the Basilica. The church is the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. Right, the church is the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. So if you're ever in the capital of our country, make sure you make a, a visit to the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. So, today being Mary's feast day, Mary, as a result of her, her yes to God, Mary's going to give us the greatest gift in the whole world. So when we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the birthday of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the essence of Christmas. The reason for the season is the gift of the person of Christ, who was born of Mary. Given that Mary gave us such a great gift, what are some gifts that we can give to Mary? I'd like to mention three. First gift we can give to Mary is this. We are living in a time of constant warfare. It's called spiritual warfare. We're living in this constantly until we die. So we have been tempted. We're going to be tempted today, probably in one way or another. We'll be tempted until the Lord calls us from time to eternity. To honor Mary, when you're tempted, call out to her and pray. The Hail Mary, or you can pray this prayer in honor of Hermaka Conception. 
that is, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have a course to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. And through the intercession of Mary, the head of the serpent will be crushed. Second gift we can give to Mary would be to read on Mary. The more we get to know Mary, the more we're going to love her. And I would suggest you might even try to purchase my new book. And it's the Contempt Compendium of Marian Devotions, written by yours truly. By reading this book, you'll be able to understand with greater depth who Mary is. The greatness of Mary. You get to know Mary, love her, be willing to follow her and to imitate her virtues. And, of course, get to heaven. That's why we're here. And the third gift that we can give to Mary is the prayer that Mary loves most. And the prayer that Mary loves most is the Hail Mary, but even more so, Mary loves the prayer of the Most Holy Rosary. So of all days, of all days, we should try to pray with great fervor by ourselves and hopefully also with our family to pray the Most Holy Rosary. The Most Holy Rosary. The prayer that Mary loves most. You know, there are people that sometimes come and they'll say, well, Father, you know what, Father, you know what, I, I pray the rosary. And I pray the rosary and I get so many different temptations. I get so many temptations when I pray the rosary. One occasion a woman came up to St. Alphonse de Liguri the founder of the Redemptorist who wrote, who wrote The Glories of Mary. And the woman said to St. Alphonsus, you know, every time I try to pray the rosary, every time I pray the rosary, I, I've got so many temptations. St. Alphonsus says, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Because the devil is angry at you. The devil is angry. The devil is angry at you. Because the devil knows that those who love Mary, Mary's going to help us to get to heaven. So we go back to the first reading today in the Mass is taken from Genesis chapter 3, 15. And we have what is called the Proto-Evangelium. I will put enmity between you and your offspring. But she will crush your head. The head of the serpent. The head of the serpent, the head of the devil will be crushed through the heel of the woman. And that woman is Mary. St. Louis de Montfort, who gave us true devotion to Mary, said that we're called to be the heel of Mary. So I'd like to also invite all of us to pray for groups that are consecrating themselves 
to the Blessed Virgin Mary today. And I know of there are two groups that are actually using my book. It's my other book. It's Consecration to Jesus Through the Mysteries of the Rosary. One is a group in Redondo Beach, Mary Costello, who I talked to yesterday about giving a retreat. And the other one would be Irene Copioso and her group. They will be consecrating themselves to Mary using my book. What a beautiful, wonderful day to consecrate herself to the Blessed Virgin Mary on her solemnity, which is the Immaculate Conception. Remember to say that prayer over and over again today as you wear your brown brown scapular and your miraculous medal. Saying that prayer, O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. So I'd like to give you, my friends, my priestly blessing and make sure that you go to Mass today because today also is a holy day of obligation. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.